Price earnings ratio, one of the most widely used indicators. You hear it all the time, TV, radio, press, etc. People often also refer to what they will call a forward price earnings ratio. Um, I'll touch on what that is. It's a great tool. It's a very useful tool. There are some drawbacks to it. Uh, we will delve into those and, and touch on, on, on the pros and the cons. Like everything, I suppose, there's good and bad. So first, some basics, PE ratio. It is literally the price earnings ratio. I'm going to delve into exactly what we mean by that in a moment. It's an indicator of price versus value. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. So Warren Buffett always says, a company is worth X, but that price will change minute by minute, day by day. The value of the company is not changing minute by minute, day by day. That's changing over time as they grow businesses, gain clients, lose clients, shrink businesses. But it is certainly one of the, one of the best ways to find a direct relationship between the profitability of a company, that's their earnings per share, and the share price of a company. So whilst there are some, some drawbacks to it, certainly a, a top indicator in terms of how it works and how we can use it, and I stress we use it for investing. This is not a trading tool by any stretch of imagination. It enables to compare against peers. It's very important that we look at apples versus apples. Uh, we would compare Billiton against Anglo. We wouldn't use it to compare Billiton against Standard Bank. Uh, different sectors, different companies typically have fairly different ranges within price earnings. Uh, banks typically don't go above 13. Um, your gold miners probably typically don't go below 20. And sometimes, of course, we get a negative price earnings ratio. That means the company has, frankly, made a loss. We'll touch on that in a bit. You can also use it to compare a company against itself, a long-term average. I've done a webinar on that. I've got a slide, so I'll come to that in a moment. First, what is price earnings? It is literally the price divided by the profit. So the price you're going to pay divided by the profit. Now what we do in this case is we say, well, it's the price per share, so it's the profit per share. Another way of saying profit per share is earnings per share. EPS is the shorthand term. So price earnings ratio is literally take the share price and divide it by the latest earnings per share. It's important we get annual earnings, in other words, a full year earnings rather than just the six months. So if there's a year-end earnings, we get the full number. If there's a mid-year earnings, we need to go and manipulate to get a 12-month average. In other words, the first half of this financial year and the last half of the previous financial year. And that gives us price earnings ratio is equal to price of the share divided by earnings per share. So quite simply, what you're paying divided by the profit. And that's why it's considered to be a metric of value more than anything else. So it's telling you what value are you getting. As I said, Buffett says price is what you pay, value is what you get. That value broadly is going to be more static. The price, of course, is changing fairly quickly depending on the volatility in the market, but certainly in the stock market changing day to day, minute to minute. I mentioned the PE range. I've done a webinar on PE ranges. You can find the uh, URL down at the bottom there. That's a short URL. That's why it looks funny. Jo jol.to slash question mark 7 capital K. What I often do, and I'm not going to spend too much time on it simply because it's, it's, it's a whole webinar on its own, is I will find a range in which a price earnings trades at. So there we have an example of pick and pay, a 12-year price earnings range. And when I'm looking to buy my boring blue chips, I would look to buy them when they're trading below their low average. In the case of pick and pay, that low average tends to be 15 and the high average tends to be 18. If you want to be more of a, of a momentum trader, you'd be looking to take some profits above 18, and you'd be looking to enter below 15. In my long-term portfolio, I'm buying to hold, so typically I would look to enter with price earnings below 15, and then I'm happy to hold. And the logic is quite simple. I like pick and pay. Okay, these days I don't, but in the days when I did, I like pick and pay, and I says to myself, I want to own it, but I want to buy it, only when it's cheap. And price earnings is a, a mechanism we can use for the determining cheap. You can see some fairly steep falls. If we look over towards the left of the chart over here, uh, a number of steep falls. That will be as the new earnings come out. Remember again, price is updating every day, every minute. Earnings only update every six months. So if we go to the next slide, we can see it 
as that price is rise, as the price earnings, at the blue line is your price earnings, as it's rising, that's because the share price is rising. Then suddenly results come out, the earnings per share increase, and suddenly the price earnings will drop down. Then share price continues to rise, and we will see a rising price earnings. Six months later, new set of results, another increase in earnings per share, and we get another fall in the price earnings. So typically, you're going to see this almost like a, a sawtooth type of shape in the price earnings. And if we go back to the previous slide, it's not quite as clear, but certainly we can see those drop-offs, those sudden drops as we got new, new numbers coming through. Then, of course, there's this one here more towards the right of the chart, and that was the crisis of 2008. So there were two things that hit it here. One, earnings per share came out, which took the price earnings ratio down, but two, the price was falling. So because there are two variables going in, if the price is rising, the price earnings ratio will be going up. If the price is falling, price earnings ratio is coming down. And that's one of the, the tricks with it, one of the, the ugly or the bad in the sense that a, a price earnings that might look attractive might be the market saying, hang on a second, we're going to be getting some ugly results coming out. We're, going to be expecting a, an earnings uh, to be falling and hence, we've got a situation where the, the price earnings has fallen in anticipation of those earnings coming down. We also get something called an earnings yield. I'm going to touch on it very briefly because it's linked. It really isn't used much these days. Uh, you'll often see earnings yields quoted alongside the price earnings ratio. In essence, it is the inverse of a PE ratio. So if a price earnings ratio is price divided by earnings, your earnings yield is earnings divided by price, you multiply by 100 because it's represented as a percentage. Now this is very much an older indicator that would have been used back in the 70s and the 80s to a fair degree. And the logic was that you want your earnings yield to be above your, your risk-free yield, which is your, your government bonds in essence. As I said, they're completely linked. You could use either or. Um, certainly these days, it's all about price earnings. You will very, very seldom hear someone actually referring to a, a earnings yield. To go into some examples, we've got two companies here, M&O and ABC. Let's assume they're both in the same industries. They're both doing the same broad um, businesses and the like. They both make 2,000 Rand profit per year. That's earnings per share of 2,000 Rand, and they're both for sale. The one is on for sale at 100,000 Rand, the second is on sale at 12,000 Rand. Now, this example, we can see immediately, you want to buy ABC. You want to buy the one on the right, you're much cheaper. The price earnings tells us that too. Price earnings is price divided by earnings, so company MNO, 100,000 price, 2,000 earnings, price earnings of 50. Whereas company ABC, 12,000 price, 2,000 earnings gives you a price earnings of 6. And what we can also see from that, in a sense it's saying, if you buy the company, how long before the profit of the company pays for the company? Now remember, you don't get all the earnings. Some of that earnings per share will be paid to you in dividends, if there is a dividend policy. The rest is retained in the business to grow it. But you're a shareholder, so you benefit from that growth in the business. So in the example on the screen at the moment, we can clearly see that ABC is significantly better value than company m &O. And that was easy to see as well, 100,000. But at the end of the day, you're getting 2,000 rand of profit a year. Do you want to pay 12,000 for it, or do you want to pay 100,000 for it? Now, I did stress up front, these are same company, same industry, same part of growth. If company m &O was saying, hang on, we're growing our earnings at 50% per year, whereas ABC is only growing their business at 10% per year, well, then maybe it's worth that extra price. And that, that's one of the shortfalls of the PE ratio. And then we come into a peg ratio. I'm doing a webinar on that in about two weeks' time, which says, well, yes, this gives an indication of value, but let's be honest, part of the issue is how fast is the company growing? And the faster a company is growing, perhaps you're prepared to pay a little bit more. Two examples in recent times, uh, NASPAS and Capitec, both growing, well, NASPAS was up in the 40s, uh, Capitec was up in the half 40s, low 50s, so you were prepared to pay a higher value for it, because when those new earnings came in, 
the earnings are going to be significantly higher and that will take the price earnings ratio down. Another example, I've dropped m and and I've bought an XYZ. Made it slightly different. We've got two companies. Again, let's assume they're in the same industries. They've got the same sort of growth rate, so we're comparing apples with apples. Company XYZ trade is making a profit of 6,000 versus the 2,000 for ABC. But it's on market. You can buy it for 24,000 versus 12. So in the one sense, you think, well, heck, 24,000, it's twice the price. But the price earnings ratio, 24,000 cost divided by that 6,000 of earnings gives you a PE of 6 for the left-hand company, whereas the right-hand one is a price earnings of 12, sorry, a, 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 an asking price of 12, a earnings of 2,000 gives you a PE of 6. So although you're paying a higher price, for company XYZ, you're paying 24,000 Rand for it. You're getting much better value. You're paying double the price, but you're getting three times the profit. Hence, that lower PE can tell you, presto, that is better value. That company is cheaper when we compare them relative to each other. You get more for your money. Now, in the share market, you don't have to buy the whole company, so you could invest just 12,000 and buy half of it. And then we can see the relation. If you bought half of the left-hand company, that would entitle you to 3,000 a year, and you paid 12. Whereas the right-hand company, ABC, you paid 12,000 a year, yet it entitled you only to 2,000 profits. It is it's critically important that we compare those apples with apples, those two stocks relative to each other. You know, putting them in the same sector, um, ideally broadly the same sort of growth. You know, if we're looking at banks, and let's say we take Standard Bank and ABSA, we can make a compelling argument that one of them might have a better growth prospects in, in, in the short and medium term, um, and, and, and that's why often we will use a forward price earnings ratio, and that's a fair shot to use a forward one, and that kind of negates the, the slight difference. But Standard Bank and ABSA, they're both big banks, both in South Africa, uh, they're both going to be growing at broadly the same rate. One might do 12% growth and the other one might do 16% growth and that's certainly different but broadly it's the same. So you'd look at two stocks within the same sector or three or four however and compare them. And then you've got stock A at a price earnings of 15, stock B at a price earnings of 9, all things being equal, stock B is offering better value. So the, the key component of, of price earnings is saying that you know, price on its own doesn't actually give us enough information. It doesn't tell us what do we get for that price. What are we getting when we hand over our money to buy a share or a tranche of shares on the JSC? Price earnings gives us an indication of what value we are buying, of what we actually get for it. The key benefit for it, it's, it's great to determine the value or valuations between two stocks in the same sector. As I said, always apples with apples. Uh, it's quick, it's easy. And it's good for mature stocks. And why do I say mature stocks? Or what do I mean by mature stocks? I'm meaning those sort of boring blue chips, sort of like the big top 40 shares, those that are not growing at 30, 40, 50, 100 percent a year. As soon as the share is growing by that amount, your price earnings becomes a little bit wonky, and then perhaps you need to move to the peg ratio, which is price earnings growth. So they're better for mature stocks. They're better for what I would call income stocks, i.e., stocks with dividend yields of more than two, two and a half percent per year, as opposed to your growth stocks, which might not have much dividend uh, and certainly are, are showing high growth. And again, the two examples at the moment on our market is Capitec and NASPASS. The drawbacks, quite simple, uh, earnings per share is updated only every six months as results come out. So the, the, the one component, there are two halves to it, the one component is saying quite simply, well, you know, what happens when you're looking at, at uh, a price that's changing every day, but the earnings only update every six months? And that's certainly one of the drawbacks of them, um, that price update. And that's why you can go to historic or a future earnings per share. Now, what are we looking for in the case of historic? We go and find a, a future earnings that we're expecting. So a company came out with results, let's say, this month, and you say, well, what do we expect earnings to be for those results that will be coming out in 12 months' time. And we plug those into the price earnings ratio. So instead of using the historic numbers which have just been released, you use forward numbers. 
Now, where do you find those forward numbers? You can get them from consensus data. Um, INET does consensus data. Profile Media does consensus data. So you can find them in that consensus data, which is a view of the industry as a whole, what they think future earnings in a stock will be. Not all companies are covered. About 100, 110 have got that consensus data on them. And of course, the risk is quite simple, that the consensus is wrong, that there's an absolute, you know, 2008 happens again, and what, what we experience is that the consensus isn't anywhere close to reality. But that gives us an idea of what we're looking for that future price earnings to be. And I know a lot of asset managers, a lot of uh, uh, investors and the like, use that future price earnings instead of a historic price earnings. It gives you a, a, a more close to the coalface, not without its risks, of course. And of course, the falling price earnings has been, is falling for one of two reasons, um, and primarily it's going to be, well, the price is declining. And if the price is declining, then it might be the market saying to you, hang on, you know what? Price is declining because we expect earnings to be declining. In other words, the market is anticipating a fall in the earnings. Now, the market could be wrong, but certainly that's what it's looking for. So falling PE could be because uh, earnings are rising and we've had a new earnings number come in, which has seen the PE drop, but it could also be because we've got a falling share price. Now, that's easy to determine. If you see a PE that's been on the slide for the last four or five months, simply go and have a look. Is it the share price that's been falling? If the answer is yes, well then, why is the share price falling? Is it falling in, in, sync, in sympathy with the general market? Is it falling because that particular sector or perhaps stock is under pressure? You've got to ask yourself some questions why that price is coming down. And yep, we've got a nice looking price earnings, but if the earnings then fall, we'll suddenly see that price earnings ratio shoot up. So the falling price earnings ratio is not always saying to you, hey, great deals here. You need to absolutely go and find and, and do your homework, do your digging, and make sure that it all fits and that it's not just a case of, well, you know, hey, low price earnings is, is lacquer. And that's always the case. You know, price earnings is a great indicator, but I don't think we can use it in isolation. Uh, what about stocks with very high price earnings? We've mentioned Capitec, we've mentioned uh, uh, NASPAS, there are many others out there. Typically, they would be growth stocks. Um, and then we would look to use a peg ratio as part of the equation so we can understand, well, okay, there's a high price earnings, but is it being offset by a peg ratio or by expected growth that makes that high price earnings not such an issue? Certainly in my case, I'm only really focusing on PE ratios when I'm looking at my income shares, when I'm looking at my, my blue chip, what I call my death just part portfolio, where I'm looking to buy a couple of select blue chips and ideally to hold them forever. I hold them until death do us part. Either I die or they die, whichever happens first. Quick recap, a great tool, a very simple tool to help us determine value. Um, nice and easy. Uh, once we understand how it works and what's working behind it, it really does give us an opportunity to do a quick look at it. We can also use it for a market as a whole. We can take the top 40 and say, well, what's the current PE of the top 40 relative to historic? Uh, I mean, last I checked, the top 40 was sitting in a price earnings of about 14, which is about average. It goes up to as high as 18. I've seen it as low as uh, 9 or 10. Um, so telling us that our market is fairly priced. If we look at a forward price earnings on our top 40, uh, if we can get growth of, say, 20% in the next 12 months, from those stocks on average, that would take our 14 PE at the moment down to about 12, or, or sorry, about 11 and a bit, which would then indicate some value. So is our market overvalued? Well, currently fairly valued. If we're jumping forward, we're saying, well, it depends what sort of growth we can expect. If we can see 20% growth coming through from, from the market uh, and the stocks within it, then in fact, it's probably offering us some value. The big question, can we expect that 20% growth? Important we use it in conjunction with other tools. It's not a tool to be used in isolation. What I typically do in my death to us part portfolio is I will go and identify blue chips that I like, and then I will use that PE range. As I said, they've done a webinar on that. You can go find it on just one lap. And I will use that range to tell me when to buy. So it means I'm buying the quality, but I'm buying the quality when it's offering me value. 
And that's very much what, what, what uh, price earnings is about. It's about value. If you look at value investing in its entirety, it is a very complex, very wide process, concept. You can spend uh, forever. I mean, Benjamin Graham, Warren Buffett have spent their life refining value as a concept. Uh, price earnings is probably the first entry into value as using it as an investor. That, folks, is price earnings, the good, the bad, uh, and the ugly. As I said, it's a great tool, not without some issues, but certainly worth having a look at. If you've got any questions, you can throw them in the text box. Uh, if you've got a mic attached, if you raise your hand, I will take the questions uh, via microphone. I can see Ashton asking, he's saying, Minto has a price earnings of, uh, let's call it 46, market cap of 91 million. Uh, why would such a high PE be as a result of the case considering it's a small cap share? The issue there, uh, Ashton, is that they've made very, very small profits. In other words, their earnings are very small and hence their price earnings is very, very high. So they're on what we would call an onerous price earnings ratio and we would need them to significantly come to the party with really, really good results to justify such a high price earnings ratio. Now, if they could double their earnings in the next reporting period, that would halve their price ratio to 23. It's still onerous, but a whole lot less. Uh, I'm also seeing someone asking about negative uh, price earnings ratio. A negative price earnings simply means that in the previous period, the earnings were minus. In other words, they had a loss per share, and that then gives us a negative price earnings. Uh, for money, your mic is on, you can take your question. Yeah, um, let's say all things been equal for a company, and the company had, let's say, 10 private jets, and they decided to sell all those jets that needed, they don't need them anymore, they decided to use cars. What, what kind of impact would that have on the PE? Because they'll be receiving a huge chunk of money by selling those uh, private jets or so. Okay, a great question, and and that that issue really comes into uh, what we would the differences between earnings per share, headline earnings per share. Earnings per share is just pure earnings. So in other words, if they sold off their jets to buy a, a, a fleet of secondhand Mazda 323s, then certainly uh, that would have an impact on the earnings per share. And that's why, although I refer to earnings per share here, typically we use headline earnings per share. And the key distinction is headline earnings says is that one off issues are not brought into those earnings. So if they sold their fleet of Lear jets, that wouldn't impact because it's a one-off. The problem with headline earnings per share, because it's, everything has a, a plus and a minus to it, the problem with headline earnings per share is that what we see is that a lot of costs that are one-off costs could perhaps not be recorded through headline earnings. So this year they go and buy 10 Lear jets. And it doesn't get, you know, it doesn't get priced in because it's a one-off. Next year they go and build a new head office and it doesn't get into the headline earnings because it's a one-off. The year after that they go and buy 10 yachts. So you see what I'm saying? There can be a different one-off event, but there's always a one-off event. And that's why typically when I'm looking at a, at a headline earnings per share, I'll quickly want to go over look see and see what they've excluded from it to get an idea whether what they've excluded as fair or whether it perhaps it can be taken as an operating cost. We'll leave it there for the day. Uh, price earnings, powerful. It's important to understand what goes into it. It's often important to interrogate uh, both the price and the earnings part, um, particularly to Fomani's question, but also if price is falling, what's it telling us going forward? But certainly a very useful, and uh, what I like about it, a very, very simple and very useful tool. Thanks very much for your time today. All the best. I hope you take something away from the webinar.